Good okay, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our latest Woodland and Wildlife webinar. I'm Andrew Kling with the University of Maryland Extension at the Western Maryland Research and Education Center in Keatesville. And that's in Washington County. We're about 10 miles south of the city of Hagerstown. And today's webinar, Status of Emerald Ash Borer in Maryland and Potential for Impact to Tidal Hardwood Swamps, we're going to have two speakers. Uh, Colleen Kenny from the Maryland DNR Forest Service and my colleague Jonathan Kays from the University of Maryland Extension. Okay, so everybody thinks they can hear me now. Wonderful. Thank you for letting me know. We hold these webinars on a periodic basis. If you'd like to learn more about them and stay informed with, uh, with the upcoming schedule, we invite you to join our email notification list. Send an email to listserv at listserv.umd.edu, or you can contact me directly, akling1 at umd.edu. And we try to keep these fairly small to uh, keep the bandwidth issues down. We usually keep it uh, to the first 100 uh, people who register, but that generally isn't a problem, or it hasn't been in the past. And if you discover that you want to share this webinar with someone else after it's over, we do share these on our YouTube channel. We record them and post them to the YouTube channel within a week or so. And that's at youtube.com slash C slash UMDFSE. Or you can just search for Woodland Stewardship Education Program on YouTube and you'll find us there. We also invite you to spend some time on our website at extension.umd.edu slash woodland or like us on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash umdfse. Uh, we have a wide variety of resources on both. The Woodland Stewardship Education website is a little more specific to uh, Maryland and the Mid-Atlantic area. The Woodland Stewardship Education Facebook page is often a little more national and global in scope, things that uh, are of interest to uh, forests and woodlands in general. And we invite you to wander through both of them, and you'll never know what you're going to find. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the chat room. That's the easiest way to get my attention, get the presenter's attention. If we have time at the end, we'll, have, uh, we'll invite you to have some questions. We already have uh, at least one that we'll try to get to. And if we don't get to your question, please email it to me, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, We'll write back to you directly. Once again, my email is at akling1 at umd.edu. If you're attending the, the webinar today for continuing education credits uh, from MDA, we're going to have five questions that you're going to need to answer. And what we'd like you to do is jot them down and then send them in an email either to me at akling1 at umd.edu or to Jonathan Kays, jk's at umd.edu in order to qualify for the credits. Because what we do is we collect the, the answers, we send them on to MDA, and they take care of issuing the credits. And we'd like you to make sure that you do that today uh, rather than wait for the recording. Just to make sure that everyone was paying attention, we'd like you to do that by 1.30 PM. So there's going to be five questions. I've got two, and Jonathan will have the others. And just to make sure that everybody is paying attention who needs to be paying attention. So, without further ado, here is the first question. What is the name of this famous landmark? Now, jot it down, and when you have all five taken care of, send your answers to me or Jonathan, akling1 at umd.edu or jks at umd.edu. And once again, try to get these in by 1.30 today so we can get you all recorded and get your credits to you. Okay, so our first presenter today is Colleen Kenny with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. She's the forest health planner with Maryland DNR Forest Service. She's based out of Annapolis. She coordinates invasive species projects across the state, including emerald ash borer planning and management. So Colleen, go ahead and turn on your camera, and I will shift the uh, participant ball to you and let you take over and go ahead and let us know what you have to say. We appreciate it and stand by for Colin. Okay, hopefully you can hear me. All right, great. Uh, let me start my screen sharing here. Okay, 
Um, so I'm going to just give a little uh, background information on Emerald Ash Borer um, and then go over some of the um, projects that we're working on here in Maryland, um, sort of the status of EAB and the response efforts here. Um, so this is an adult emerald ash borer. Um, the adults usually um, emerge from ash trees sometime around mid-spring, um, and they will feed up in the canopy of ash trees for a few weeks, um, and then they will mate and lay eggs on ash trees. Um, they don't usually cause too much uh, feeding damage in this stage, um, and you don't really see them too much. Um, but a few weeks after laying eggs, those eggs will hatch as larvae, um, and those larvae bore into the tree, um, usually starting sometime around early summer. And this is where they're causing most of the damage to ash trees. So these larvae feed on the vascular tissue of the ash trees um, that's transporting water and nutrients throughout the tree. Um, and basically it cuts off that flow of water and nutrients, <coughs> excuse me, um, so that the uh, tree basically will starve. Um, and so this is the stage where they're causing most of the damage to the ash trees. Um, they will kill all native species of ash trees that we have here in the U.S. Um, <coughs> and um, we're seeing close to about 100% mortality of our native ash trees. So if your ash trees are infested, um, the first thing that you're likely is woodpecker damage. Um, so you can see on the left-hand side there, you'll see some of those lighter flecks in the bark. Um, and then on the right-hand side, um, a tree that's a little bit more advanced where the woodpeckers have really gone after it. Um, so the woodpeckers eat the larvae that are underneath the bark, and so they'll strip off that outer layer, and you get that kind of beige um, orangish color where the underside of the bark gets exposed. Um, so woodpeckers are a lot better at finding the larvae than humans are. So if you start to notice um, that look in your trees, that's a good sign that you have emerald ash borer. Um, <clears throat> the next thing that we'll see is crown dieback, uh, usually starting from the tops and the sides of the tree, um, but also thinning throughout the tree, um, which you can see a little bit on the left-hand side there. Um, one of the diagnostic signs that you have emerald ash borer in your tree is this D-shaped exit hole. That's the hole that the adults make when they emerge from the ash trees. Um, and um, that D-shape is really the characteristic of emerald ash borer. It's got that one flat side. Um, we do have native borers that will make um, larger, more round, or oblong holes. Um, but when, when you see that D-shape, that's a sign of emerald ash borer. So here again is a picture, a side-by-side -side comparison. So up top you have the emerald ash borer exit holes. They've all got that one flat edge. And down at the bottom, um, it's one of our native um, ash borers. Uh, you can see the exit holes are much larger, uh, more like the size of a pencil eraser. Um, and they're sort of round or oblong. Um, if you could peel back the bark on an infested ash tree, you'd see these serpentine galleries. So that's where the larvae are moving through the tree and feeding on that vascular tissue. And then what the um, trees do is they try and peel over those galleries um, with uh, sort of a callus tissue, and that'll force the bark to split in these vertical cracks. Um, I usually see these either on younger trees or on small limbs, um, not so much on mature trees with the really thick bark. <laughs> and then lastly, um, lots of trees, when they're under stress, will um, put out epicormic sprouts. So those are sprouts along the base of the tree, like you see in the picture, <laughs> or um, they can sometimes be along branches. Um, but when you start to see all those little shoots going up, um, that's a sign that the tree is under stress. Um, trees will put these out for lots of reasons, um, but if it is an ash tree, um, that's a good sign that you have emerald ash borer. So um, what can we expect here in Maryland for our ash trees? Um, we're seeing our trees die within about one to three years of showing symptoms. That's a little bit faster than what they've seen in some of the more northern um, states, like the lake states, um, most likely because we have a longer growing season, um, a longer active period for the larvae. 
and we're seeing about 100 percent mortality unless trees are chemically treated um, and that includes small trees so um, trees down to about one inch in diameter will be attacked by emerald ash borer and they really just need to be large enough for the larvae to fit inside to feed um, and then lastly there's this uh, phenomenon called ash snap um, which you can see in the picture below um, so when ash trees get infested um, they dry out and become really brittle um, and so that's causing ash trees to snap um, oftentimes right at the base like you see in the picture or large limbs will snap um, right at the joint um, so on the one hand that is a major safety concern uh, where ash trees are growing near homes or along roads um, but also a lot of tree care companies won't remove ash trees that have been infested with EAD. Um, so that means if you're a homeowner and you've got these ash trees growing near your home, um, it's a good idea to get them removed um, as soon as possible because um, you may, might need to end up paying for like a crane or a bucket truck for that tree care company to remove the tree um, if they're unable to climb it. Um, we also have about 16 other insects and invertebrates um, here in Maryland that uh, require ash trees at some point in their life stage. Um, so um, we don't exactly know what's going to happen to these other species, um, but it's something to think about when we're, when we're planning our response efforts. Um, okay, so as of 2014, um, EAB had moved across most of the western shore of Maryland. Um, this is a map of positive sites here. Um, and just a side note, so we do uh, uh, positive infestations at the county level. So, for example, you'll only see one star in Frederick County. That doesn't mean that EAB has only been found one place in Frederick County. Um, it means it was found there, um, so we consider that county infested, and, um, and then we'll move our resources to looking for it in other places uh, where we don't know if we have it yet. Um, you'll see a lot of those positive sites down around Prince George's County. So that's from back in the early days back in 2003 when we first got EAB we had a single point of entry um, and through a nursery in Prince George's County um, so we tried to eradicate it um, and so a lot of those positive sites are from those eradication efforts um, but EAB sort of just kept moving a little further and further beyond where we were attempting to eradicate it until that eradication zone just became too big to manage um, and so then we kind of switched over to management and containment from there. Um, as of 2015, EAB made it into Baltimore and Harford County, um, as well as um, onto the Eastern Shore for the first time. So uh, we found it on Kent Island, St. Michael's, and in Cambridge. And since then, we've also found it in Cecil County, um, up near Fair Hill, in Kent County, in Tolchester, and in Easton. Um, and the Kent County and, and the Talbot County finds um, were pretty well advanced when we found them, so um, there's a good chance that EAB had been there for several years before we knew about it. So there is a federal quarantine on ash products. Um, basically, any untreated ash products can move within the yellow area in this quarantine zone. Um, they can't move outside of that red line. Um, so, you know, products could move from North to South Carolina, but not from South Carolina to uh, Mississippi, because um, that's outside of the red line. Um, uh, there are a couple caveats to that. So, um, some states have additional requirements. Uh, for example, Pennsylvania, um, has a ban on all out-of-state firewood that isn't treated. Um, so it's always good to check with the individual state if you will be moving products across state lines um, to see if they have any additional requirements. Um, the other caveat is that it's still a best practice to keep any untreated products as local as possible. Um, so for example, in Maryland, we have a lot of areas on the eastern shore that are not yet 
infested with emerald ash borer. Um, so if we're moving things like firewood over onto the eastern shore, we're really going to speed up that infestation. Um, and we're going to lead to much faster decline of our ash trees over there. So it's always still best practice to try and keep things like firewood local to the source. Um, so in terms of where we've got ash trees in Maryland, um, this is a map from our Wildlife and Heritage Program um, that um, they basically collect um, really detailed natural community data across the state. And what they did was pull out all of their um, community data plots that had ash in them. And so this isn't complete coverage of the state, but it gives you a pretty good idea of what's going on. Um, so ash is mostly a riparian species in Maryland, so it grows along our streams and our rivers. So you can see, um, not sure if you can see my pointer or not, but along the um, Potomac River. We've got some over here on the eastern shore along the Pocomoke. This is the Manicoke. Uh, there's a cluster up in Frederick County around the Catoctin Mountain area um, up near Thermont. Um, and there are also some places where we have a really dense coverage of ash. So those orange circles are 5 to 25 percent ash. Red is 25 to 100 percent. Um, and you can see that there's some places where ash makes up a really major component of the forest canopy. Um, we've also got a couple of rare species of ash in Maryland. So um, the, the green and purple dots are green and white ash, and those are both pretty common across the state. Um, but black ash is considered a rare species in Maryland, and we've got that mostly out in western Maryland. Um, pumpkin ash are those um, orange dots. Um, and you can see those are mostly along the rivers on the eastern shore. And we also have some along the rivers on the um, lower western shore as well. And then we have one um, tiny stand of Carolina ash um, down along the Pocomoke River. Um, Carolina ash is at the northernmost end of its range here in Maryland, so um, not a lot of that in the state. Um, <clears throat> And ash trees are also a really major um, component of the forest in a lot of urban areas. So this is a picture from Thermont Community Park. Um, and just about every tree you see there is an ash tree. Um, ash is also a really common street tree. Um, it's a pretty popular tree in Baltimore City, um, planted along a lot of streets and in parks, and also just naturally growing. Um, so it's not only important in these natural areas, but it's a really important urban tree as well for things like, um, you know, stormwater runoff management and, and pollution reduction and heating and cooling costs in urban communities. Um, so we don't want to lose all of those benefits as well. So our first line of defense against emerald ash borer is chemical treatment. Um, and the gold standard uh, right now are trunk injections of emamectin benzoate. Um, the common brand name for that is triage, although there's a few other brands out there uh, that make a formulation of emamectin benzoate. Um, there are some other treatments. There are some soil drench and soil injection treatments um, with uh, imidacloprid and dinotefurin. Um, but this uh, emamectin benzoate treatment is um, the most effective, particularly for large trees, which is usually what people are treating. Um, and it also lasts the longest. So this treatment's good for about two to five years. Um, right now, we recommend that people treat every two to three years. Um, and then hopefully in time, the EAB population will crash somewhat. Um, we'll have it sort of at a lower level out there on the landscape. And we hope that we'll be able to space treatments out to every five years and then just monitor in between. Um, and the cost for this generally runs about $10 to $20 per diameter inch of the tree. Um, more like $10 if you're a municipality, municipality that's treating a lot of trees. Um, could be $20 or even more if um, you know, you're a homeowner that's just treating you know, one individual tree. Um, and the best time to have these treatments done is in mid-spring, right when the buds are breaking. In terms of selecting trees for treatment, um, if you're in developed areas, like around um, streets, parks, houses, things like that, um, you want to look for less than 30% crown dieback. So once you get up to that 30% mark, um, there's a lot of damage to the tree. Um, 
and it inhibits the tree's ability to actually take up that chemical. Um, so uh, you might not have an effective treatment. You know, might not actually be able to get that chemical to move through the tree and effectively um, protect it against the AB. Um, you want the trees to be in generally good condition, so no wounds or cavities, um, it's not being topped under power lines or anything like that. Um, basically, if you're going to spend all the money on treatment, you want to be sure that that tree is going to survive. Um, usually, people are treating larger trees, get a little bit more bang for your buck, um, you know, more aesthetic value, um, you know, more heating and cooling savings, that sort of thing. Um, and then lastly, just some sort of important value. So, um, you know, you might have a bunch of ash trees out in the woods behind your house that um, nobody really notices or, you know, takes much thought about. Um, so maybe you don't need to treat those, but maybe you've got a really nice shade tree um, right in front of your house. And so then that would be an important tree that you do want to treat. Um, and just to give you a sense of that 30% crown dieback, um, what that would look like. Um, this tree here, kind of to the center of the screen, is um, a tr an ash tree with a full crown. And then this tree here is somewhere around 30% dieback. It might even be closer to 50%. Um, so you see it's got some branches that are you know, completely bare, um, and then also the foliage is a little bit thin throughout the tree. So once your trees are looking like that, um, it's getting to be too late to treat them. Um, in natural areas, um, we want to think about some different things for treatment. So um, it's generally too expensive to go into the woods and try and treat every ash tree. Um, that's just not feasible. Um, but we are trying an approach here in Maryland where we're treating clusters of trees to try and protect a seed source in important ash stands. So um, as EAB moves through uh, a stand of trees, will have some trees that are able to pollinate and produce seeds and repopulate that stand. So um, same rules apply here, less than 30% dieback, good condition. Generally you want like large or dominant trees, um, something that's not going to be shaded out since we're talking about a forest system in this case. Um, and we're really focusing this kind of treatment on trees that have some sort of ecosystem value. So um, maybe you're in a riparian area that's, um, you know, full of ash trees. You don't want to lose all the good, you know, stabilization and, and nutrient uptake uh, of those trees. Um, maybe you've got a stand of rare species, of a rare species of ash, um, or just a really extensive ash stand. Um, so those would be places where it would be worthwhile to try and uh, save the ash component of the forest. Um, so ash trees are either male or female, and it can be kind of hard to tell unless they have seeds. So trees that have seeds are female. Um, so um, it's best to treat clusters of trees so that you can hope that you get both in the mix. Um, and then those trees, like I said, will be able to produce seeds and be able to repopulate that stand after the initial wave of emerald ash borer moves through. Um, something to just be aware of is that there are restrictions on using some of the pesticides near water, and a lot of our natural ash stands are near water, um, so be sure to, you know, check your labels and, and make sure you're doing an appropriate treatment. Um, and this is just a map of some of the areas where we have started taking this approach in Maryland. Um, that Savage River State Forest uh, stand was a, a cluster of black ash trees out there. Um, and then a lot of our sites have been along um, some of the waterways on the eastern shore where we have both rare species of ash um, and just a really huge riparian ash component, which um, Jonathan's going to be talking about in a little bit. Um, and this is just a site of one of those places. This is the Walnut Landing Nature Conservancy Tract. Um, and a lot of the trees in there are pumpkin ash, so that's a rare species. And then you can also see just what a huge ash component there is in there, um, and really important for holding, holding the land together in those riparian areas. Um, so if you're not treating your trees, the next thing to think about is removal. Um, and the best advice I can give is to remove your infested trees earlier, early. Um, it's cheaper that way and safer. You don't have to worry about having a dead tree that might fall and hurt somebody. 
Um, and you can really focus just on the trees that are potential safety hazards. You don't need to worry about going off into the woods and removing every ash tree. Um, we have so much ash and so many, so much EAB out in the landscape that um, that's not going to have a major impact on overall um, you know, scale of infestation. Um, so really focus your attention and your, your money on those trees that are going to have a potential safety hazard. Um, and then also wherever we're taking down trees, we always want to replace them. Um, so this is a good opportunity to try and diversify the species that we're planting. Um, so use a good variety of native plants um, so that we're more resilient to whatever the next pest is that comes down the line. Um, when we're planting, especially in natural areas, you always have to think about controlling invasive plants so that you have successful plantings. Um, and if you've got a riparian area, you can think about underplanting. So um, going in while those ash trees are still there um, and planting so that when the ash tree, when those ash trees die, you've already got some regeneration growing um, in, in those riparian areas. Um, so our sort of long-term approach for emerald ash borer involves biocontrol. So biocontrol is um, where you use a natural enemy of a pest to control that pest population. Um, and we've got a couple of parasitoids um, that have been released in Maryland. So these first three, Tetrasticus, Oubius, and Spathius, Agrilli, um, they've all been released in Maryland since about 2009. Um, this last one, Spathius galini, um, was just approved for release a couple of years ago, and this one hasn't been released in Maryland yet. Um, but uh, what these parasitoids do is they'll lay their eggs, either either they'll go through the bark into the larvae um, and lay their eggs in EAB larvae, or um, they'll find the EAB eggs um, and lay their eggs there. Uh, and so this is a map of our release sites in Maryland. Um, since 2009, and so far we've found that Tetrasticus has been establishing in release sites. Um, there was also a study out of University of Maryland a couple years ago that found that um, Tetrasticus was dispersing up to five kilometers from the release sites, so that's good. It's establishing and it's dispersing. Um, but what um, we've found and what a lot of other states have found is that most of the parasitism is in pretty small trees. Um, so if I go back to this last slide, um, most of our parasitoids, the Tetrasticus and the Spathius, um, their ovipositor is not long enough to get through the bark on larger trees um, and get to those larvae. So um, they're really having better control on smaller trees. This last one, Spathius galini, has a longer ovipositor, so it's able to penetrate the bark on larger, more mature trees. Um, so hopefully that'll give better control um, for some of those more mature trees. Um, but like I said, this one has not been approved, or has not, um, it's been approved for release, but it hasn't been released in Maryland yet. Um, it's native to um, parts of Russia, so it's got a little bit better um, cold tolerance. So right now it's being released in some of the more northern states. Um, so bottom line with biocontrol, populations are establishing, but they're not able to actually protect our trees and save our ash trees yet. Um, but we're hoping that as we continue to do releases and build up those populations, um, we'll get to a point where we can give our ash trees a fighting chance, um, just kind of get that um, uh, boring population down just enough that our ash trees are able to c combat it and, and thrive. Um, and we are working on an IPM approach um, that combines treatments and releases, um, particularly treating those larger trees and those seed source trees for short-term protection and then doing releases in the general area to build up that long-term control. Um, and this is a picture of what a biocontrol release uh, site would look like. Uh, so if you're out in the woods and you see these, don't um, disturb them. They're supposed to be there. Um, and this is a map of the sites where we've started working on that IPM project. 
And then the last thing I just want to touch on is lingering ash. So um, there are ash trees. Um, they've started finding them in the lake states that are just able to survive attack by emerald ash borer. Um, they're not sure if it's a genetic reason or an environmental reason. Um, but folks at a couple of universities are starting to gather this information and do research to try and figure out, um, you know, what makes some of our trees resistant. Um, and, you know, from there maybe we'll be able to develop some sort of breeding program or something um, to help with um, restoration. Um, so here in Maryland, we're um, asking people to just be on the lookout for trees um, that might be lingering ash so that we can, you know, start getting a database of these together um, so we can contribute to some of these research efforts. Um, so what you want to look for here is trees that are greater than about 10 centimeters diameter at breast height, um, so reasonably large trees um, in stands with greater than 95 percent mortality due to emerald ash borer. So that's important. You don't want trees that have just escaped um, EAB. You want trees where it's clearly been in the area um, and caused a lot of damage, but some trees just seem to have been able to survive. Um, so if you know of any of those trees, um, I would gladly um, take your information. Um, my email and my phone number are there, so um, please reach out. Um, and, you know, if you've got any other questions about EAB, I'm also happy to um, answer any of those. So um, with that, I will turn it back over to uh, Andrew. Okay, thanks, Colleen. Uh, we'll invite you to hang on, and uh, we may have some folks who have particular questions for you as as uh, as Jonathan finishes, and as we have time to take questions, we'll go along. So, in the meantime, what I'd like to do is bring on Jonathan. Okay, uh, welcome. My name is Jonathan Case. I'm an extension forester, University of Maryland. Uh, a couple of the uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about another issue that uh, hasn't been discussed all that much. Uh, regarding um, EAB uh, in terms of its impact on tidal forest wetlands, especially those around the Chesapeake Bay and the Eastern Shore. So I want to, you know, give some light to that issue. And uh, I have a couple slides that are similar to Colleen's. I'll just kind of go through those. Um, but uh, this is something that's just a little bit different. Um, and I will start my PowerPoint. And I imagine you can see that. So um, just in terms of, uh, just to kind of put the whole issue in context in terms of what's going on with EAB on the Eastern Shore and how, a little bit how I got into this. Um, as we know, this is a map of uh, emerald ash borer in 30 states and Canadian provinces. And you can see where the initial detections are and basically the native range of ash, uh, most of which is uh, where it's found in abundance, has is, is pretty much been impacted by EAB at this point. And the similar, um, uh, slide that you find that uh, Colleen had as well that were all the um, quarantines uh, have taken place uh, that disallow the, you know, don't allow the movement to be outside the quarantine zone. Of course, most of our areas are in that zone. Um, and the transport of firewood, obviously, which, you know, impact can be a, a you know, a major, uh, a major factor here that we want to avoid. Um, and in, in a lot of the involvement with ash, and again, uh, as a forest landowner myself, it's really been in the upland areas and rural areas, uh, outside of urban areas, has been its impact on it as a resource. And a lot of the initial recommendations for woodland owners were that uh, if you had ash was to actually do some type of a salvage operation so that you could at least realize some value from that timber uh, before it basically fell down to the ground, which is, you know, basically what happens to it. And many landowners have done that. Um, at this point, much of the state has been impacted in terms of the upland resource, which is a lot of white ash for, for, for to a large extent, uh, but not necessarily. So uh, Colleen covered very well the impact in urban areas. And uh, in terms of the ability to save ash trees that are, um, you know, value trees around residences or in urban context, and the, the types of uh, chemicals that are out there with triage and um, that's a fairly, you know, effective uh, chemical for injection. Um, a lot of work has been done on this uh, by, by, by Dan Herms and others at Ohio State and, and probably the Bible for understanding insecticide options for protecting ash trees is this publication that you see here. 
that is on our website at extension.umd.edu slash woodland. Uh, but uh, probably one of the best sources that's, that's around in terms of what you need to know if you're a um, uh, you know, pesticide applicator in terms of what is the most current recommendations. So, and, and uh, um, Colin did a great job as well as talking about biocontrol in terms of, you know, the status of the um, parasitoids being released and the uh, relative success of a tetrastichus uh, um, uh But again, mentioning the limitation in terms of only really having oil deposits are large enough to really deal with trees that are pretty much under four inches in diameter. So at this point, we're kind of you know, looking for other um, parasitoids with larger overpositors that can exist in our climate and can um, perhaps protect larger trees, but they don't exist. And, and the future of this is, you know, we just are uh, don't know at this point. Um, so there's a lot of research and experimentation going on with that. The, the ash species that we're really talking about that are most prominent in the state of Maryland, she mentioned, is white ash, which typically is more of an upland tree. Um, and green ash, which is one that predominates throughout many of the wetland areas and tidal forests of wetlands around the Chesapeake Bay, and then small areas of pumpkin ash that exist on the lower eastern shore. And even though you see the the, the map here, um, I think you can see my 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 um, cursor here. It doesn't really show it in southern Maryland, but it basically is found in the in the lower tributaries of the um, Choptank and the, the Pocomo. So. Um, those are the three major species we're talking about. And as she mentioned, really, this all started in 2003 in southern Maryland. Um, and uh, what we've seen is pretty much EAB traveling very quickly throughout southern Maryland, very quickly out into western Maryland, and at this point kind of starting to come around into the northern counties, um, where in areas of Baltimore County and Hartford County, they're just starting to see infestations uh, that are a lot of mortality. And so those woodland owners that have expanses are just still maybe the opportunity for some type of salvage harvesting to take place. Um, but you know, left to its own, whether it's be, you know if it's being carried by firewood and on vehicles, of course it can be transported quite quickly. Uh, but uh, relatively on its own, it's relatively short distances, and um, that becomes somewhat important when we look at uh, kind of what's happened uh, at this one site in uh, in um, by the Tuxet River. So again, when we look at this, this is the same graphic that she had in terms of seeing now that it's been found, you know, uh, through Western Maryland, kind of working its way up into Baltimore, Hartford counties, and over on the Eastern Shore. And for those of people that live in Western Maryland, they think of ash and you know these large stands of, of white ash and uh, even some green ash, reaching relatively large diameters. Uh, the real difference here is that's not what we really see on the Eastern Shore. Um, so EAB, and then this is a, I, the extension, University of Maryland Extension was provided a grant by the DNR Forest Service to do some outreach to landowners and with um, uh, landscape, you know, arborists and stuff on the eastern shore on EAB, similar to what's being done on the western shore for a number of years. And uh, well, behold, you really start looking into it, you see that ash is not a commercial species. Um, you don't find large diameter ash stands. Um, and there's relatively few ash compared to the western shore in urban residential areas. Uh, there are some, and of course they're being impacted. Uh, but most of the ash is really found in tidal uh, and non-tidal as well, hardwood swamps. And uh, this is a this is a major issue because these you know tidal um, you know forested wetlands I'll call them um, are basically um, have you know major ecological um, you know value. Um, so the real problem uh, with EAB on the eastern shore, of course it's a problem in urban areas and can be protected um, by injections, but in the rural area, uh, in, in, in natural areas, the real problem is this ecological problem and what is going to happen if EAB gets into these, uh, let's see, start seeing a lot of mortality on these um, forested uh, tidal area wetlands. So let's just take a, a quick look at that for a few minutes. Um, first of all, there's a very much a lack of awareness uh, on the eastern shore of the potential impact. We've tried to correct that through some of the things I'll mention here, through some programs and through, you know, working with um, 
uh, you know, pesticide recertification sessions and things like that. So, but let's look just at, you know, tidal freshwater forests or wetlands um, as a more of a western shore upland guy. Uh, these tidal swamps are, I guess, found typically known as uh, cripples. I'm not sure if that's because you get crippled when you step in them, but with the limited experience I've had, uh, I could see how it's easy to get stuck and crippled. <laughs> so, uh, but the major species in these in these cripples uh, are green ash and pumpkin ash, um, more so even green ash. And of course, when you look at this graphic here, you see these are areas that are right along the water rate repairing areas. It's kind of what's holding these these uh, riparian areas together. And you can see the streams kind of meandering through them, the mainstream. So of course, any more large scale mortality in those areas is gonna have a lot of impacts. And um, usually it's more in these upper reaches where there's a little less salinity, slightly less brackish. Um, but uh, these, there's a lot of diverse vegetation in these forested wetlands. This is another map that was uh, developed uh, based on some uh, GPS a GIS data from the DNR Forest Service it kind of shows a similar thing, and and that blue outlined area is kind of what you see on the uh, graphic to the right. So uh, it shows a little bit more expansive, um, exactly which one's more accurate. You know, it's so hard to tell. The fact is that there probably is a lot of green ash and pumpkin ash throughout all these areas. So what's the potential ex extent of impact? if we were to see a large-scale EAB impact in these forests of wetlands. Well, ash trees are the single dominant tree species of many of those tidal, uh, tidal freshwater forests of wetlands throughout the U.S. Atlantic coast. This isn't just Chesapeake Bay problems. It goes well down into North Carolina and Virginia and up into New Jersey as well. And you can see 141,000 acres of ash-dominated tidal forests of wetlands and more than half of those occurring in the three Chesapeake Bay states. So when you look at water, potential water quality impacts, uh, they are huge. Um, this is just some pictures that kind of demonstrate what some of these areas look like. You'll see you have these kind of marshes, and then when you get um, beyond that, you get into these, this hummock and hollow topography. And, um, and I should mention that uh, at the beginning that this, uh, a lot of this research and a lot of these slides, uh, the work I'm mentioning is really the work, the result of uh, Dr. Andy Baldwin, wetland ecologist with the University of Maryland, and I've been working with him uh, on this uh, on this project. And uh, but he is really the wetland uh, ecologist and professional, and um, my my position in a lot of this is doing a lot of the education and outreach. But uh, the point you see here is that a lot of these forests and wetlands have this hummock and hollow topography, so these. These hummocks are these raised areas, and typically when you look at that picture there, you'll see that uh, that's where you see most of the trees growing. And indeed, in that picture, most of those are uh, pumpkin ash or green ash growing. And then you have these hollows where there's um, you know, all the sediment, and of course, as the tide goes in and out, you, know, you get water coming in and out. But when you step off these hummocks and into these hollows, you're probably going to go up to your knee or above in black muck. So, what is the impact, uh, you know, if this area were to be see a lot of mortality and this hummock and hollow topography were to break down, which likely it would if there's nothing holding it together. You know, will that turn into marsh? You know, what's going to be the impact uh, environmentally? So this is just a larger picture of showing some tidal freshwater uh, marshes and, and wetlands on Marshy Hope Creek and the Nanakrook River. And uh, just to kind of show you what this looks like. Um, and uh, this, this is another graphic, actually, uh, again, was a, provided by uh, the DNR Forest Service, kind of showing where there's these potential uh, forested, uh, you know, tidal har forested swamps uh, along this one area. I think this is found in Anacoke. It might have been in Chop Tank. I kind of forget at this point. Uh, but uh, you can see, again, <laughs> when you start getting large uh, storm events and things and, and storm surges, the loss of those that anchor of vegetation is going to be um, fairly fairly serious. Now, what happened? What brought this to light was really, um, and what foreshadows the massive impact that could occur, is a western shore example that occurred in Patuxent Wetland Park, in um, in PG County. Um, 
And this was um, located, you can see there's actually Patuxent Wetland Park, there's a, a landing there where people put in kayaks and canoes and things like that. Many people probably pass by this area. And this was discovered because Dr. Uh, Andy Baldwin, uh, again, wetland ecologist, had a swamp area in that, in that region that was being instrumented. And uh, it was basically, the, it was all set up. And you can kind of see what this area looked like in 2015. You can see all the trees on top, still somewhat, um, um, you know, have all the leaves. And on the bottom, in, in the spring of 2016, basically, all the ash trees died. Uh, it was just gone. Uh, just happened just like overnight like that. And uh, you can see this completely defoliated green ash canopy. And this is looking from the swamp, you know, into the, into the wetland area uh, or into the, the, into the forest wetland area from the open water creek area over the marsh. And uh, again, graduate students, other students who are working in this area, it was instrumented. There's boardwalks throughout it. It's the only way you can really work in these areas because you'd sink up to your knees or beyond. And they had all these litter traps and everything was set up. And then 2015 and all of a sudden, 2016, everything died. And this is kind of what it looked like. So the ash canopy, there is some scattered, uh, you know, some red maple, some black elm, poison ivy mixed in there. But this is largely a, a green ash swamp site. And uh, you can kind of see what happened over the course of 2016. All of a sudden, all the light that came in, uh, you got all these annual marsh plants that came in, uh, in those hollows. And um, uh, a lot of your hummock species were still there, the ferns, sedges, and asters. But again, there's a lot of other annuals coming in, and probably very well may shade those out. Um, and then shrubs and small trees are persist. Uh, but again, what's going to be the future of those things as you look at this uh, over time? So. Um, Many of the uh, ash trees, uh, Colleen mentioned this, basil bark sprouting. You know, when they, the top starts to get stressed, you get this emicorphic branching. 69% of those trees have emicorphic or basal branches. Likely they'll probably die off, but uh, we don't know exactly. And 89% of the canopy trees had no leaves. So what are the impacts? Well, I mean, what's going to happen to these hummock and hollow areas like you see on the left, you know, as they get filled in? Um, are they going to, you know, it's going to affect water quality? Are you going to get, how, how valuable are these areas going to be for stopping storm surges, changes in wildlife, and of course a big concern with invasive species coming into these areas. And so these, these are the unanswered questions really. And so what does this mean for tidal swamps on the eastern shore? And you look at Hillsboro, you're looking at mostly ash, uh, green ash, I believe mostly over off that landing there. Uh, so what's going to happen if all that dies? You're going to get all those types of ecological changes. So um, again, these are just some other pictures along the chop tank and tributaries that have mostly green and pumpkin ash. Uh, major, major changes that can have impacts, uh, major impacts on water quality. Uh, and just a final note here, if you look at the top 10 tree species in the Nanticoke River tidal forest, and this is data from Andy Baldwin, uh, you see that fraction of species are the main species. So the point is that this mortality is not there yet. We're not seeing the mortality. And it could be because these areas are so remote. You know, you don't have people camping in them and, you know, being in a lot of these areas, although, you know, at fishing holes and things for sure. So, um, uh, you know, we haven't seen the mortality that you've seen in uh, the rest of the state. Many of these sites contain red maple, and a white cedar, black gum, it's that subcanopy on the southern eastern shore, more bald cypress. So, you know, what's going to happen? Uh, what are the opportunities here in terms of if you get a lot of, uh, um, a, you know, a lot of mortality? So the uncertainties are, what about those persistence of basil sprouts? Will they survive? Um, and uh, Colleen brought up this great thing about lingering ash. You know, are there lingering ash in these systems uh, protect that should be protected? Um, and, and seeds could be taken from them and, uh, you know, could be regenerated or, you know, reproduced in nursery, whatever. So, um, and then what about seed production and seed recruitment of new seedlings? We haven't seen a lot of that uh, in many areas, but, and then there's this other species question. What about those subcategory trees? trees? Uh, can they take over? Well, there are relatively few uh, and far between in many of these systems that are largely ash, so that's, that's probably not likely. And again, we have the whole loss of the ecology of these hummock and hollow species. 
And uh, I talked about invasives, so Phragmites, uh, I don't know, multiple rows, honeysuckle, all kinds of things that come in. That come in. So these ecosystem changes in the microtopography, uh, are we going to see elevation changes as these, these areas are going to slough back into perhaps marsh or open water, providing less, um, um, less protection against storm surges and things like that. And of course, there's all the wildlife impacts we don't really understand yet. So the point is, as a course of extension and with a, as a research uh, you know, university, um, there definitely is some research now to assess a lot of these baseline conditions. We've uh, selected some marsh sites that would be good candidates to follow for long term so we could understand the impact of the EAB and, uh, EAB and implement some of these the management and restoration strategies to see what will work when. Um, and uh, some of those strategies involve underplanning trials of associated species that you see already in these stands, like you know, Atlantic white cedar, bald cypress, and others. Uh, as Colleen said, treating groups of mature ash trees to show a sure supply of seed in the future, and that's being done in some areas. You know, identifying and propagating lingering ash. Are there some interesting genetics there uh, that can be propagated in the future? And then where are the best sites for regeneration and underplanting? Uh, that's a whole other question. So the take-home message here is that there are vast areas of tidal freshwater forests that probably will experience some type of catastrophic disturbance. We haven't seen a lot of it yet. Um, there have been some areas for sure, but uh, very concerning about these forests at Harvard wetlands on the eastern shore, which are quite extensive. Um, and the loss of ash, you know, it's going to have cascading effects. A lot of uncertainty. Um, some research would be uh, valuable, um, but uh, right now we don't have that. Um, what can you do, like uh, Colleen said, reporting ash, lingering ash, uh, reporting large areas of mortality, it would be great to chart these areas, uh, you know, as we see uh, some mortality occurring. If you see large areas of, of ash mortality in some of these forests and wetlands, perhaps your property or other places you piss, it'd be great to let Colleen know or perhaps even, you know, contact myself or a, uh, even your local uh, DNR forester. And you can find that information on our website uh, under find the Find a Forester link. So in terms of outreach, uh, we've increased a lot of awareness on the issue uh, on the Eastern Shore. We've, we have a fact sheet that's on our website that has a lot of these maps and things. Uh, we've done some pesticide recertification trainings with arborists and landscape contractors. Webinars such as this. Uh, we also had two forest health workshops on the Eastern Shore in 2017, 2018. Um, the presentations, you know, the actual audio and the PowerPoint presentations of those are posted on our uh, website under the webinars as well as on our YouTube channel. So we are seeking research and extension grants. Uh, one we had applied for, unfortunately, was not funded. Um, but tracking mortality and where it occurs at this point would be most of what we can do. And with, of course, the, uh, the, the projects that the our Forest Service is continuing to, uh, to implement. And uh, so that's where we are. You know, there's probably something going to happen, uh, but we just haven't seen the mortality at this point. So with that, uh, just remember, these shores on places for on the eastern shore are not uplands. Uh, these are not easily accessible sites. They're not easy places to do research either. So, um, um, but hopefully um, we can have some under, better understanding of what these strategies can be. With that, I'll say thank you very much, and I encourage you to go to our website uh, at extension.umd.edu slash woodland and uh, you know, look at some of the resources and YouTube videos we have on this topic. Thank you. Uh, we have a question uh, that either you or Colleen can answer, I'm assuming. What is the average age for ash trees to start producing seeds? And uh, I'm not sure which of you can want to tackle that, but uh, either one of you go ahead and, and uh, answer that if you would. Um, I, I assume like a lot of trees, I mean, maybe even as, you know, as five or ten years, ten years old sometimes, you know, I'm not sure exactly. I'd have to look it up. They can be relatively young and still produce seed. I've seen, uh, maybe Colleen has another um, some more direct experience uh, that she's seen working with more of the ash recently. Um, yeah, I'm not, uh, I think you guys can hear me now. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, it can 
they can be pretty young. It sort of depends on site conditions too. Um, you know whether they're getting lots of sun in a good healthy spot or not. Um, but yeah, they're pretty prolific seed producers too once they once they get going. Okay, and we did have another question at the very beginning. Let me see what it was. Is there a specific location I can go to in Queen Anne's County to see evidence of EAB? Um, I believe there is a high school on Ken Island that has a bunch of ash trees planted around it, and I have heard that they are seeing significant dieback right now. Okay, great. Um, Jonathan, did you have uh, the uh, the other questions for the for the folks getting the uh, applying for credits? Uh, I think you should just tell them what it is. Uh, it's a uh, oh, okay, triage, triage, okay, T R E E slash A G E. Well, how about uh, identify two of the species that are uh, subject to E A B on the uh, on the eastern shore, pumpkin okay. ash and Green ash. Green ash. Yeah. Okay, so those are the five. We have the the first picture of Mount Rushmore, the picture of the Gateway Arch. We have triage, green ash, and pumpkin ash. Those are your five that you need to email to us. So we're just about out of time here. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, if you have any other questions, drop me a line, drop Jonathan a line, or drop Colleen a line. And I want to thank you for joining us today because this has been an interesting experience for us all. And once again, this will be available on our YouTube channel at UMD FSE and hopefully we'll have it up by next Tuesday. And if you have any other questions, please let us know. Uh, thank you all for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>